we're very thrilled to welcome Dr. Bessel van der Kolk from the US who is on here today and I will just be giving a very short introduction to Mind Medicine Australia. If you could wave your hands if you're from other places, wherever you're from, Australia, if put in the chat where you're from, what state you're from or what country you're from, we'd love to welcome you all, our brothers and sisters from around the world to this Mind Medicine Australia webinar. And if this is your first time on one of our webinars, we welcome you as well. And you can see people from all over Australia, the US, New Zealand, Missouri, Mississippi, Central Texas, Vancouver. Yeah, huge amount of people have registered for this webinar today, well over a thousand people. Um, so we're, we're really excited to, to welcome you all. We're going to begin by acknowledging the people of our ancient lands, their elders, past, present, and emerging leaders. And we also acknowledge the wisdom keepers, the medicine keepers who've brought these medicines to us throughout the ages to help us with our healing and to raise our consciousness. And we acknowledge all the people whose shoulders we stand on in these ancient medicines. And we need them more than ever today with the increasing mental illness that we're experiencing in our communities, increasing loneliness, trauma, and social isolation. So we're going to um, start off just with a very short video, an introductory video about Mind Medicine Australia for those of you who are new to us. If you are new, raise your hand, and give us a bit of a wave and we welcome you all, thank you. And we'll show you this short video just now. Thank you, Ilan. Did you know that over 45% of Australians will experience mental illness in their lifetime? That's <coughs> nearly half of us. Everything feels flat and I'm not sleeping. I feel, I feel ashamed. ashamed. Mental ill health devastates lives and families and costs Australians around $60 billion a year. Research and treatment expenses continue to rise, yet rates of mental illness indicate that we're losing the battle. New approaches are urgently needed to address this immense suffering and cost. Psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy is currently being trialled worldwide and has demonstrated remarkable promise in treating depression, anxiety, addiction and post-traumatic stress disorder, with new trials underway for treatment of dementia and anorexia. The treatment combines a short program of psychotherapy with just a few medicinal doses of psilocybin or MDMA. In the 1950s and 60s, psychedelic treatments had a major impact in psychiatry, and many considered it the next big thing in mental health treatment. But for political reasons, the Nixon administration criminalised the use of psychedelics and effectively stopped all research. That research has finally begun again, with proper clinical support, psychedelic treatments are safe and frequently lead to remission after only a short program and even where current treatments have failed. Here at Mind Medicine Australia, we believe everyone should have access to the best treatments for mental illness. We will seek to establish best practice in regulated psychedelic assisted treatment. Mind Medicine Australia is wholly focused on the clinical application of psychedelic medicines. We're preparing for change by developing therapist training, ethical guidelines, a centre of excellence in psychedelic medicine, educational material and events, and supporting clinical research. We're a small organisation doing big things, and we need your support. Please share this video and visit our website to support us and get involved. Uh, thank you everyone and we'll put a link for that video in the chat if you want to share it further we'd be very grateful and um, we're just going to show a very few slides uh, now to give you a bit of a background on Mind Medicine Australia so this 
webinar is called Understanding and Healing Trauma Through Psychedelic Assisted Therapy with Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. Next slide, thank you. Uh, we focus entirely clinically on the use of these particular therapies and we will be recording this webinar and putting it on our YouTube platform and welcome you to share it. We know that many people have registered who can't come on the webinar right now and we welcome them to watch and join and support our community. Next slide, thank you. So in Australia, we have an increasing mental health epidemic, which is getting worse daily. Pre-COVID, one in five Australian adults had a chronic mental illness with one in eight Australians on antidepressants, including one in four older Australians and one in 30 children on antidepressants and other psychiatric medications. Since the pandemic or during the pandemic and, and throughout this period now, we're seeing an enormous spike in these figures with an estimated four in five Australians saying their mental health has declined uh, or 34% saying their mental health has declined, but four in five saying their mental health is not that good. And an estimated one in two of us said to experience a mental illness in our lifetime. Next slide, thank you. Unfortunately for our veterans and first responders, the incidence of mental illness is far worse. And you can see that here on this chart. And we really reach out to veterans and first responders, whatever way we can to support them and help them to get well and lead meaningful lives and thank them for their service to the community as well. Next slide, thank you. Of course, mental illness has a huge impact on sufferers, families, carers and people with mental illness are more likely to be unemployed or homeless and tragically more likely to commit suicide. In Australia, the cost of mental illness and suicide in the last year, according to the Productivity Commission, was around $220 billion per year. Next slide, thank you. We say that the elephant in the room is the lack of innovation in treatments for mental illness now for nearly 50 years. And uh, here's this elephant trying to get the attention of his bureaucrats. And the bureaucrats keep saying, well, we'll train more psychiatrists and more psychotherapists and psychologists. Uh, we'll provide more patient access gateways, more subsidized sessions. But if you can't get to the root cause of a person's suffering, you can't get them well and leading meaningful and healthy and happy lives. So we need to get to the root cause and that makes this particular webinar even more relevant. Next slide, thank you. In the case of depression, with current treatments, only 30 to 35% of sufferers experience remission from either uh, antidepressants or psychotherapy. Relapse rates are high and the side effects are significant. In the case of post-traumatic stress disorder, remission rates can be as low as 5% with existing treatments. So it's clear that more of the same isn't going to solve the problem. Next slide, thank you. So we're a charity that was set up in early 2019 to help alleviate the suffering caused by mental illness in Australia. The charity was set up by myself and my husband, Peter Hunt, and it's the sixth charity that we've set up our goal is to ensure that we can alleviate our mental health epidemic and alleviate the suffering and suicide in our nation by expanding the treatment options available. For us, success means that these therapies will become an integral part of our mental health system. So if you go to your practitioner, they'll give you a choice of traditional psychiatric medications, psychotherapy, other treatments, including psychedelic assisted therapies, with full disclosure on the risks and the benefits of all kinds of treatments so that people can make an informed choice. We also hope that these treatments will continue to achieve the high remission rates that they've been achieving in nearly 200 trials around the world. And those remission rates are 60 to 80% after just two to three medicinal treatments with a short course of psychotherapy. And as a charity, we want these treatments to be accessible and affordable to all Australians, no matter what their background, where they're located in Australia. 
So we also plan to start a fund to help subsidise those who can't afford uh, the cost of these treatments. Next slide, thank you. So as I mentioned, one of the remarkable things about these medicines is that they require so few sessions to actually achieve healing curative effects. These are not just palliative treatments, we're not just managing a condition. We really hope that many more patients can get well and get out of the system. And the medicines have also been shown to be very safe and non-addictive in medically controlled environments. And they've been granted breakthrough therapy status by the FDA in the US, which is a really rare designation. It's only given to medicines that could be vastly superior to existing treatments to fast track the approval process. And at the moment, MDMA is sitting in phase two trials, sorry, part two of phase three trials in the US and um, is due potentially for uh, registration over the next 12 to 18 months as a medicine. We'll show you those trials now. You can see them just here on this next slide, please, Alan. Oh no, not this slide, but we'll show you the trials in one moment. So what's happening in the brain, and I'm sure that, that um, Dr. Bessel will talk much further about that and, and many of the processes that um, he's been using for treating trauma. But effectively what's happening is that these medicines alter the communication between different brain networks and hemispheres in our brain and they bypass what's called the default mode network of our brain which keeps us defaulting to many of the patterns and programs often formed in early childhood and as we saw on on the short video many of those programs cause us to to ruminate and go around in very limited thought loops. And you can see that on these representations of fMRI scans on the right here. The right one being someone with depression or trauma with very limited neural networks and neural connections. And then you see the one on the left with the ingestion of the psilocybin. And interestingly enough, there's the same amount of dots and lines on both of these diagrams. It's just the one on the left is a really connected brain. It has increased neurogenesis, um, increased neural plasticity and increased sense of oneness, a connection with self, the others and the planet that leads to a person who's suffering with a mental illness that is feeling very separate and isolated and disconnected to have an opportunity, a window of opportunity for trained therapists to work with that patient to fast track their healing because their brain has become uh, more flexible and more malleable during this period with uh, the use of these medicines. And it's very important that integration occurs, which is why we call these treatments psychedelic assisted therapy, because it is the medicine plus the therapy that creates these outstanding remission rates that we're seeing. And patients do become more responsible for their own healing. They become agents for their own healing as well. So, Many patients describe these treatments as one of the top five most meaningful experiences in their lives, which also is very unusual. Who says that about a medicine or treatment normally? Next slide, thank you. So finally, you know, I wanna focus just very briefly on what we're doing in, in Australia, and that is to build the ecosystem so that these treatments can become available to people who really need them. And we do that through four key strategies. The first one is awareness and knowledge building. So we run events like these with some of the leaders in this field globally. And uh, many of you have been to our webinars before. We also ran a major global summit last November and we're looking at running one later at the end of 2023. We also have over 30 chapters around Australia the focus on building local community awareness and educating their local communities through events and film screenings and so on. And we also part fund um, research and we've just announced a $1 million observational study fund. And we're bringing Professor David Nutt to Australia next month and he will be announcing uh, some of the observational trials that we're going to support. And we encourage you to come and see him. He's presenting in Byron Bay in Canberra in Sydney and in Melbourne. And we also, as many of you know, have started the first professional development certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies 
in the Asia Pacific region, a four month part time program, a world class faculty that we really invite you to register for courses in 2023 and we'll be announcing dates for those shortly. We also helped um, start the Neuromedicines Discovery Centre at Monash University and have numerous partnerships with universities and academics around Australia. And um, we have also um, started looking at a healthy person's trial for therapists as well. The other thing that many of you will know is that we've put in rescheduling applications for psilocybin and MDMA and we'll shortly be running, um, well, having an interim decision on those. And um, finally, we're looking at the rollout of different clinics, the manufacturing and sourcing of these medicines in Australia. We'll just flick through these final slides. Thank you, Alan. Um, Tim Ferriss, one of the great supporters of this field and who introduced me into this space, said this is a great opportunity in which any of us can put a small amount of money into this field to support millions of people. And I encourage you all to be generous. This really is about creating change in treatments and treatment modalities in the mental health system. And people are desperate out there as we, as, as we know, members of our families, our communities and our workplaces. Next slide, thank you. Lots of people ask how you can help share this video uh, volunteer, join your local chapter, read our wonderful learn section, talk to your fellow clinicians and, and your GPs and, and medical practitioners so they understand this field. Support us, we're a charity, we can't do this alone. Talk to your local state and federal members of parliament and tell them that change is essential. The current system is not working. Next slide, thank you. We have a four week online course as well. Next slide, thank you, Alan. And this is the Certificate in Psychedelic Assisted Therapies. We encourage you to register as we mentioned and Scott will put a link on the chat. Next slide, thank you. Join your chapter, next slide. We also have a wonderful book of 53 Australians talking about their healing from these treatments. We have t-shirts, we have masks, we have wonderful little mushroom gift cards as well for Christmas and general gift cards and greetings. Next slide, thank you. And this is just one of many events um, that Professor Nash is going to be doing. He'll be presenting in Byron Bay at ANU, um, in Sydney at Paddington Town Hall, in Melbourne at University of Melbourne and Monash. And we've got a big gala dinner at the Australian Club in Melbourne with Professor Nutt as well. So. We look forward to seeing you at all those events. Next slide, thank you. And here's our upcoming webinars. Um, still to come, Dr. Jim Fadiman coming up in a couple of weeks. Then we have um, Dick Schwartz as well. And um, lots more exciting events. So we look forward to seeing you at those. And with that, I'm now thrilled to welcome Dr. Van der Kolk. And I'm just gonna do a short introduction Dr. van der Kolk is a clinician, researcher, and teacher in the area of post-traumatic stress. His work integrates developmental, neurobiological, psychodynamic, and interpersonal aspects of the impact of trauma and its treatment. He is founder and medical director of the Trauma Center, past president of the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies, and professor of psychiatry at Boston University Medical School. His New York Times bestseller, The Body Keeps the Score, Brain, Mind and Body in the Treatment of Trauma was published in 2014. And for those of you that haven't read it, please do, it's an incredible book. The wisdom and insight Bessel has brought to the art and science of healing trauma has changed the way clinicians practice for years to come. He is really, um, an icon, a leader in his field, particularly on, on the importance of body work in the healing of trauma. And um, we're very much looking forward to healing from, hearing from you today and healing from you today, Bethel. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Um, let me show you some slides here. Let's start here. Uh, so let me, so I start off with that I'm a skeptic 
uh, including about psychedelic medicine. And I've been around for a long time and I've seen things come and go. And uh, we, in, in our field, we keep sort of focusing on new things. And as we focus on new things, we also focus and we drop other things. For example, uh, for a century, hypnosis was regarded as the best treatment for PTSD. Basically, nobody does hypnosis anymore. And if we would do a real honest study, we'd compare MDMA with hypnosis. But that wouldn't happen. Um, I actually have done research in more different methods than anybody else alive. I have studied, I did the first studies on Prozac, first study on Zoloft, first study on EMDR, first study on yoga, first studies on neurofeedback, first studies on theater, and now on psychedelics. And I wish that psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors would learn all of those methods and not think that this is the one thing to do. And so some things appeal more to the popular imagination than others. For example, to my mind, neurofeedback of all the modalities I've studied and practiced probably has the largest public health capacities. It can help people to focus and to pay attention and to learn, but it hasn't gained traction. Um, and so it all depends somewhat on uh, who do you know and what culture you live on at any particular time. So uh, I'm starting off with my team. This is my wonderful psychedelic team, most of whom were trained by me over many years at the trauma center. And um, we are doing psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Uh, before we go there, I'd like to say something about PTSD because, um, you know, it's also a question of how you look at things. And uh, we have this crazy diagnostic system called the DSM, which happens to have no scientific validity whatsoever. And in order to get permission to uh, administer certain treatments, we have to link it to one of these diagnoses in the DSM. So now we happen to be studying PTSD in the context of MDMA. To my mind, clearly MDMA is not a PTSD treatment. It's a treatment for a large variety of mental processes. But because we're so stuck on uh, defining things very narrowly, that is what it goes for. So everything in life is political. Everything in life depends on the money you get, the institution you live in, the side guys you live with, the culture you live in. And so it is for PTSD. In that, you know, I've been around for quite a while. And I was actually one of the a minor character in the creation of the diagnosis of PTSD. How did that happen? A bunch of us young guys who managed to avoid going to Vietnam were working at the VA as oftentimes for alternative service. And we saw these guys who were just like us, who had been broken. And their chief complaint was, uh, I have become a monster. Nobody is safe with me. I get a new girlfriend and we sleep together at night and she moves and I attack her and try to kill her. And then I wake up and I realize that I'm strangling this woman. I have kids and uh, when they make a little noise, I scream at them and I blow up. And that was their chief complaint. But we are working for the Veterans Administration and we need to convince them that it's because of the war. And so rather than focus on having become a monster and being out of control, we focus on what happened in Vietnam. And so our diagnosis becomes a memory based diagnosis. Uh, something extraordinary happened to you at that particular moment. I was part of the field trials. I did a lot of interviews at that time to make the diagnosis happen. And we saw a lot of childhood trauma in these kids, in these guys. And we saw that they had committed a lot of atrocities, but we couldn't talk about it because politically that was unwise. So we blamed it all on Vietnam. And we made a diagnosis that based on memories about nightmares and flashbacks. Uh, they, they are relevant. But even more important is that trauma changes your brain. 
and changes your identity and changes a whole host of neurobiological factors uh, that are not particularly involved in memory. And what is also interesting, when we defined PTSD originally, uh, we said this is an extraordinary event outside of the usual range of human experience. That is the definition. And we, that tells you something about us and how ignorant we were, because we didn't know at that point or hadn't paid attention to the fact that about a third of all couples engage in physical violence, that about one 20% of women have a history of having been molested, 10% of guys. About a quarter of people have a history of having been severely beaten by their parents. Uh, so trauma is not at all unusual, but somehow it got associated with the military, uh, even though trauma is pervasive throughout our society. Uh, What's also important about our diagnostic system, how did it come into being? Uh, in the 1970s, uh, people learned to measure brain chemicals. And there were some pharmaceutical companies that were coming out with drugs that looked like promising for treating schizophrenia, depression, and bipolar illness. And now we needed to create a diagnostic system where people in Sydney and in San Francisco, Boston and London could all communicate with each other. And we drew up something called research diagnostic criteria. So we had some general idea of uh, what sort of population we're talking about, but this was not a scientific process. And scientific and psychiatric diagnoses are not real diagnoses. They're just list of symptoms that overlap in many different ways. And we knew that when we wrote the DSM and the preamble for the DSM says, this is just a list of symptoms. It is too inaccurate to ever be used for insurance or forensic purposes. That preamble disappears. And now people actually believe that these psychiatric diagnoses exist. They're just a list of symptoms. Uh, so trauma is not only about past events, the event is over. It's gone. But the brain keeps reacting as if it's still going on and it changes your identity. And the goal of therapy is to become fully alive in the present. So that's really what you need to do. So as it turns out, uh, in the US and probably Australia also, I've been to Australia at least 15 times. I tend to come every year. Um, you guys are very similar to the US. You're slightly less insane, but you have your insane parts also there. Uh, and uh, you have a very similar culture. And so in the US, the, uh, the military has traditionally been a place that people go to when they are faced with extreme poverty, deprivation, family violence, etc. So most soldiers have pre-existing histories of severe childhood trauma. Uh, and that really leads, uh, contributes to the whole PTSD picture. And the real issue is really childhood trauma and how childhood trauma changes brain functions, brain identity, uh, the way you move to the world. And uh, you all are familiar with Vince Valetti's and Robert Anders' A study. Uh, this is a study that Vince Valetti gave to me, uh, how you turn that into that in 20 years. And it's very, very clear that the single most important risk factor is childhood maltreatment. It struck me again in your introduction that you talk about the brain. I would discourage you from doing so because the brain is a very complex system and our capacity to measure it is about as primitive as Galileo's telescope compared with the reality of we can, what we can measure with the web telescope today. And I think we should look much more in mental functioning, but people don't talk about mental functioning anymore. And I am very committed to bring the mind back into psychology and psychiatry. So people again, get pay attention how people think, how people organize reality, how people make sense out of the world. And we're not doing that. We just say, oh, it's the serotonin molecule. Oh, it's the default node network. Eh, not so easy. Hi. 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 I want to.
Hello. So this is a picture of uh, a colleague of mine who lives in the theater world with me, because part of the things that we think is extremely helpful for treating trauma is theater, uh, inhabiting a different role with your body. Uh, and what we see here is that she is playing with her eight month old baby, and it always sort of makes us feel warm inside because this is really who we are as human beings. We are interactive, synchronous uh, organisms that are interdigitated with each other. Uh, the issue of screens and living off screens is actually very worrisome because we really, our brains are geared to get along with each other, to do things together, and to uh, have interactions with each other. And what we know today is that these interactions shape the brain and shape who we are. That is the work of Colin, Colvin Tavarthen, who studies the musicality between mothers and, and babies, mothers and infants, and he shows that the rhythms between these two creatures shape the brain. If you ever come to my annual conference in Boston, now in its 34th year, we have a lot of material on how the brain is shaped by interactions and by rhythmicity and how different adverse events at different stages of mind and brain development have a different impact on how the brain organizes itself. Uh, it's very complex, but you, inside of a brain, a brain is a predictive organ, and it tells us what to expect on the basis of past experience. My friend and colleague, Marty Teicher, uh, who you will hear if you come to my conference, uh, has done meta-analysis of all brain studies of psychiatric disorders. And he has shown that if you control for trauma, not a single biomarker holds up for any psychiatric disorder. The only thing we know something about is how trauma and adverse circumstances changes your brain and change how your brain is organized. And so on the basis of early experience, you know who you are, what to expect, what to expect from other people and how to communicate with other human beings. And that is really what we're up against. And what we're up against as therapists is that people create a framework inside their mind and brain that was appropriate for the circumstances under which they grew up and that later on may not fit them. And so the question is, how can we change people's identity people's brains, people's expectations, etc. And that's what I've been studying for a very long time. Uh, and so the question is really that we, the mistake we made, or the political necessity, but you know, do what you can, was that define, we've defined trauma as an event. Uh, and still, you know, I, I run one of the MAPS programs right now, I'm the PI of one of the studies. Uh, they still say, you have to identify an event. Almost nobody suffers from an event. People suffer from traumatic relationships, ongoing things that have happened, multiple traumas. It's not just one little event, not one little memory. It's the way that you have been shaped by experience and by adverse experiences. And uh, this shows, is very clearly shown by the work of my friend, Cardinal Lyons Ruth, colleague of mine at Harvard, who has studied kids from very early on, from very dysfunctional parents. And she shows that the biggest impact on mental health issues is not specific trauma, traumatic events, but it is the attachment relationship between you and your parents early on. And she has followed people over, over many years, and she has shown that the, the great predictor of depression, suicidality, anxiety, 
is the quality of the attachment relationship at age two and three. And that the childhood abuse, the particularly traumatic events, are secondary contributors. So they're really relational and identity issues. Um, and then at some point, I was, I, I was called by an, uh, a foundation that said, Dr. Velikov, we have been following your work, and we wonder if you'd be interested in our funding study for you on the effect of trauma on learning. And I said, that's wonderful. Nobody's ever called me uh, to offer me money. But do you know the work of Dante Cicchetti? No, never heard of him. Do you know the work of Frank Putnam? No, never heard of him. Do you know the work of uh, Alan Shroof, the Minnesota Longitudinal Study? They never heard of him. And I said, you know, there is a lot that's known. But the problem is that if people don't read those articles and don't learn about it in school, just doing another study won't make any difference. And so that foundation and I, instead of doing a study and yet another study on the effect of trauma and learning, went to Congress. We had, I knew Senator Kennedy, uh, some other of my colleagues knew some other people, and we convinced the uh, Congre US Congress to set up, and set up a national child traumatic stress network to study the effect of trauma on children. And that network it consists now of about 150 sites around the US uh, that gets funded to the tune of at least $50 million a year. So that's a very good thing. And so as we looked at what these kids suffer from in the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, is that they suffer from intense dysregulation of their bodies, dysregulation of their emotions, having difficulty paying attention, being able to, uh, having difficulty controlling their behavior, and a very deep sense of self-hatred, loathing themselves, and oftentimes hating other people. Uh, and so that became a, a diagnosis that we studied. We had data on 40,000 children, and we proposed to the American Psychiatric Association to make a new diagnosis, developmental trauma disorder. And we studied all these kids, we, sub uh, we submitted all these data on all these kids, and we were sure that with so many data that uh, the American Psychiatric Association would accept this new diagnosis. But have, have we did lots of articles about it. And then at the end, the APA says the consensus was there's too little evidence to include developmental trauma in the DSM-5. The, ex the notion that early childhood experiences leads to potential developmental disruption is more clinical intuition than a research-based fact, except we had research on 40,000 children. So they rejected that. And as a result, we continue to live with all these crazy diagnoses in the DSM that are basically meaningless. So we can call our patients PTSD, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, reactive attachment, there's a non suicidal intervention, this one, but you can call it. And we give people these diagnoses not because we know what's wrong with them but in order to get reimbursed by insurance companies. And so our field is a profoundly corrupt field that isn't capable of even the most elementary diagnosis of what is going on with the people we, we deal with. Uh, luckily, my book has steadily outsold the DSM and may have uh, something to do with him. And so what we're dealing with is to be dealing with minds and brains that continue to live in the past. And the question is, how do we get people to live fully in the presence? Skip this for now, because I'm going to talk for a long time, short time. And so what, what is a very important study for me is an Australian study by the man I call my best friend and his colleagues, Alexander McFarlane. And so you see a study here of 38 normal Australians there are normal Australians, in case you're wondering, and 38 very traumatized Australians. And what you see is that um, when you're not traumatized, when you get a um, stimulus, like a sound like eh, uh, the, your left brain, your cognitive analyzing brain makes sense out of it, and your right brain, your emotional brain, doesn't play a role. When you're traumatized, your left brain doesn't do anything, so your reasonable 
mind is not functioning, but your emotional brain processes information. And what we also saw, saw is that people who have been traumatized have very different uh, EEG patterns, neuronal patterns, than people who are not traumatized. So I and some of my colleagues got very interested in how can we change these brain circuits and that got us involved in neurofeedback. And then we got involved in EMDR, <coughs> which I'm not going to talk about either. But um, we did a large, first large study on EMDR. And what we found is that um, we compared EMDR with Prozac. And what turned out is that after eight weeks of treatment, uh, one out of five people on EMDR said, I'm completely cured. One of eight people on Prozac did the same thing. A two month follow up without further treatment, 28% of the EMDR people say, I am cured. And another six months later, 60% of the people in EMDR say, I am cured. As far as I know, this is still the best outcome study of PTSD that has been published. Um, but we found something else, even better than the psychedelic studies we have. Uh, um, but it was another thing, and that is after we got the diagnosis of PTSD in the DSM, a um, bunch of my colleagues and friends and I got together, including Judy Herman, most notably, and I started to say, but early childhood trauma causes it has a different impact than adult onset trauma. And so what we found in that study, and I'm showing you that in, uh, as a preamble to the psychedelic study that we, as I'm still in the middle of, is that what we found that people who were abused and neglected early on as adults did not do particularly well in response to EMDR. Sometimes it's very helpful, sometimes it was not helpful, but people with adult onset PTSD did spectacularly well with about an 86% cure rate. Again, I don't know of a more favorable study than that. So when people say, oh, psychedelic, treatment is so great, I go like, compare it with what? If you compare it with a lousy medication, yes. But if you compare it with a good treatment like EMDR, or possibly hypnosis, it may not do all that well. Be skeptical, be a scientist and don't run to conclusions. Huh? And so I'm not going to talk about that. And then, so we studied all these different things. And then at some point, um, Rick Doblin over here, there's a little party in my house, there's Ron Siegel, there's Dick Schwartz. Uh, Dick, uh, Rick Doblin comes to visit me at some point about 15 years ago with Michael Mithoffer. And they say to me, Bessel, you know a lot about trauma. Um, what do you think about psychedelics? And they say, you're talking to the right guy. You know, I'm a child of the 60s. I did my share of LSD in college. And I think it was wonderful. And not only that, but I have a bunch of very world renowned scientist friends. And I've asked every one of my friends, they could take LSD in college. And they all said, yes, I sure did. And I asked my friends, so what do you think LSD has done to your life? And they all say, as I would also, is that a very important part of why I've become a very creative scientist is because I took LSD, because it allowed me to realize very early on in my life that I live in a very small part of reality and that the reality outside of me is so much larger than anything that my little mind can contain. And so it is a wonderful thing. Not only that, but I occupied Timothy Leary's office at Harvard for a while. So I'm a fan. But I have to warn you, in 1994, I called all the LSD, all the LSD researchers together to do sort of a post-mortem. And this was the most depressed group of people I'd ever met. They all had had these amazing results and they were criminalized. They had lost their academic careers and the drugs were declared illegal. And I said to Michael and Rick, don't do it. These are illegal drugs. You'll never get it done. And they said, thank you very much for your opinion. And they went to the FDA that turned them down and they turned them down again, turned them down again, and they sued. These are very nice people, 
but they were very committed to doing it. So they, um, they sued the FDA, they did a level one trial, just an uh, uncontrolled trial, then they did a second trial, the level two trial, that came out well also, and then they did a level three trial. And they called me up and said, Bessel, would you like to be the principal investigator of the Boston side of our MDMA trial? And I said, I would be delighted. So we started to do MDMA assisted psychotherapy. And this has a long, uh, long history. You've already heard it was declared illegal, but we are doing it extremely carefully. And we are, uh, we are uh, treating, have treated now a lot of people in our little lab. And I'll show you what it actually looks like. So this is a patient being treated by Michael and Annie Mithoffer uh, that shows a lot of the profound things that MDMA can do. Uh, think about it now when I got blown up myself. I, uh, I don't know, I see it completely different now. I, thinking about it, I really, that moment that I got blown up when it was happening and everything was moving so slow and my mind was just racing at the speed of light. It was, and I can really go back and visualize it. I've never been able to visualize it so hard before. I can really feel what it was like, and there was this. So there is something about MDMA that allows people to go into that dark part of themselves. That under ordinary conditions, they... Are you ready to take your capsule? Sure. So Michael <laughs> Mithoffer and his wife, Annie. I just want to tell y'all, I had this like um, this really intense like feeling come over my body and my heartbeat started beating real fast, but I didn't get at, at first like I started feeling like a little afraid, but then once I started breathing, I, I mean, I've never felt that before. Like I really felt my heartbeat start to slow down and everything when I started breathing and just relax and like mm -hmm. sensation and it was like, amazing how not quickly it went away, but just how in control I felt of mm -hmm. making it go away. So mm -hmm. usually I've, I've had those feelings mm -hmm. in a way, it kind of felt like when a panic attack kind of comes on mm -hmm. and my heartbeat started and I felt my whole body flush and mm -hmm. get really hot. And then mm -hmm. I was just amazed how I was able to not really fight it, but mm -hmm. kind of relax. That's good. I just thought y'all yeah. yeah. might want to know yeah. that. Yeah. So you may have I just feel like I should tell y'all something. I was just really amazing. It's hard to put it in words. Um, Feel things that would, that would come up, and then every time there's there's just blow away like sand, and just and I even purposely tried to think of things bothersome, like you know, like money issues or something, and this voice, this part of me, just like so wise and so intelligent, just like brought this piece over me.
a fascinating thing happens all regularly in our MDMA sessions is that people spontaneously go into a mind frame that your next speaker in the series, Dick Schwartz, my very close friend, uh, has taught us her internal family system therapy that people start talking about parts of themselves. And when you know about trauma, you know how people divide up in parts, uh, a scared part, an aggressive part, uh, a terrified part, a controlling part, and that people start to cope with trauma and have different personality states to deal with the external reality that shift quite a little bit from time to time. And what we see as people go through MDMA, the different parts start talking to each other and communicating with each other. And you can see an integration of the personality. I can tell you that's a hell of a lot more interesting than uh, talking about the default mode network of the brain, which I happen to have studied also. But this psychological functioning is really what's so remarkable that people make peace with their internal selves. It's just said, you know, You've always been taken care of. You always will be taken care of. There's, there's nothing to worry about. And then it just flows away like sand. Mm. And then I tried thinking about that aspect of me that's just really rageful. And also, besides that image I told you all about of, you know, the fighting with them, I had this image of it, like, in a jail cell. Yeah. Yeah, like I had yeah. that mm -hmm. part of me is locked up in jail and it's just, you know, got, it's dark, but it's got, you know, you know bright red eyes and, and just really evil. And I thought of that and I felt like so, I felt like I put that person there and I went to it and just opened the door and hugged that person and then the eyes just faded away and it no longer had kind of an evil look to itself and like we like I visualized both of us just taking apart the jail cell and just you know like really becoming friends and then I visualized I visualized that image I told you about of me like it coming out of my hips and it stabbed me in the side and everything mm -hmm. and I just had a strong visualization of me like reaching up where the knife was on my side and taking it out and like I took my hands off of its neck and didn't choke it anymore and just like really embraced it and like I don't know I feel like I don't know, I, part of me realized that I think that I was taking that person and, and keeping them locked up because I was so afraid of them and then that by putting them in that cell and keeping them locked up that I was just making it worse for him. Mm. And that was mm. really more beneficial if we kind of work together. Mm -hmm. What you see here is an internal integration. And this is something we see all the time in our work, is people coming to terms with very tough stuff. I have to warn you, this is not fun and games. People get in touch with very deep, very painful experiences. I know that from experience, for example, as principal investigator of our site, uh, I had to go through MDMA myself and the first time I took MDMA I had always poo-pooed how seeing all these traumatized people um, wasn't so bad vicarious trauma isn't so bad if you have good colleagues you have a good marriage and and you're pretty well put together it isn't so bad well I was wrong on my first MDMA session all of my traumatized people I've seen which is a few thousand came to visit me and I felt the pain that I had been carrying for them. I lie there for eight hours going, oh shit, oh fuck, oh my God, that's horrible. Oh my God, do people really use this as a, as a party drug? 
there was nothing fun about it. It was extremely painful to be in touch with all the pain of all the patients I've treated over time. And then I had another MDMA experience. And um, I was born in 1943. Uh, and in the winter of 1944, 1945, there was a famine. About half of my generation died and uh, there was it was a terrible circumstances and in my second mdma session i uh, experienced myself as a one-year-old how real is that we don't know we don't know what we can remember but i felt what it must have been like for me to one-year-old starving my father was in nazi prison my mother was completely overwhelmed, didn't have time for a baby, and I felt that terribly sick, abandoned, starving little boy who I once was. Uh, this is not fun and games, but it puts you into touch with very deep personal things. So very central to our work is to create an envelope. The set and settings are critical. We train people extensively. We always have two people in the room, people come in, and we get to know the people we work with quite well. We have at least three, like three hour sessions. Then they come in for a whole day at eight o'clock in the morning. They get their MDMA. We have two therapists sitting with them. They play music. They're very quiet. It's very hard work to be set that silent for a long time. It lasts for eight hours. People deal with whatever comes up. Half of the people get placebo. Half the people get MDMA. A lot of people who get placebo also do a lot of work because most people don't get eight hours of therapy. Uh, and sometimes our clinicians and our subjects don't know if they got the MDMA or the real stuff because it still is a very intense experience. And my clinicians are very good clinicians. So I really was worried that when we did the analysis that the psychotherapy alone might do quite as well as the MDMA assisted psychotherapy. That turned out to, not to be the case. And so people have their whole day experience. They sleep overnight in our lab with the lab manager. They uh, wake up the next morning. The therapists come back, interview them for two or three hours, and then they see them two or three more times in the next month. Then another whole day, same protocol, debriefing, uh, several debriefing sessions and the third day and again and then the study is over so it's a very intense extremely carefully done study and I'm really glad it's so careful because as a consequence we have had no adverse side effects uh, this is not going to happen when people st stop being as careful as we were because when you blow your mind very very painful stuff comes up and the therapists need to be prepared to just hold the space for people to go through what they go through. It's a lot of work, takes a lot of stuff. And so uh, this is a study. And um, now the interesting thing is that as I entered the study, the study had already been designed, but I told my colleagues in the psychedelic world that when we did our MDMA study, which I just showed you, our, our EMDR study, that people with adult onset PTSD did very well. It actually is a very treatable disease. It's not a 50% relapse rate. In, in our studies, it's more like 80% success rate, um, adult onset trauma. But in our study, as I showed you, people with early childhood trauma uh, didn't do very well on the EMDR at all. And I told people in the MAP study, you know, you would be better off not having people in the study who have never had a safe moment in their lives. People who do not suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, but of lifelong trauma, who have no imprint of what it would have been felt to be safe and, and secure. It's a lifelong traumatic stress. And I was overruled. And as it turned out, almost all the subjects in our study were lifelong complex trauma people developmental trauma with multiple comorbidities and that is what made the study so extraordinary not the fact that it was helpful for ptsd we know many other ways of 
getting PTSD cured. But the big issue of, but the hardest people to treat is developmental trauma. And there we had the great results. So as it turned out, when people had just psychotherapy, they did very well, but people had psychedelic therapy plus MDMA, they did much better. And so the results were very good. But the issue in the last study, the current study, was that the vast majority of our patients had developed mental trauma. And we asked them, uh, who do you remember feeling safe with growing up? A lot of them said, I have never felt safe with anybody. These were people who had were, were just hanging on for dear life. And they all had jobs. They all were able to support themselves. So they were somewhat functional people, but boy, their lives were very hard and they had multiple very bad adverse experiences. And so the PTSD did very well. But then when we started to open up the data, the stunning stuff came out that to my mind is the real finding of the study, uh, uh, not the, what the FDA was looking for, but what I as a trauma expert was looking for. Does it work for developmental trauma? And it turned out that the number of adverse childhood experiences had no impact on the outcome. In fact, what we found is uh, that people who had early developmental trauma did extraordinarily well. And then I put in a number of measures that are not PTSD measures, but are self-experience measure, measures. And that's why we found a great difference, much to everybody's surprise. The, the brown bars is people who got very good psychotherapy. But if you got psychotherapy plus MDMA, there's a dramatic increase in self-kindness, a dramatic increase in lack of self-judgment, people accepting themselves for who they are. Uh, uh, one of the things about being traumatized as a kid is you feel alienated and you feel like you're not a member of the human race. After MDMA, people felt I'm a member of the human race. When you're isolated, you feel God forsaken. That's a very deep, profound sense of loneliness. That went dramatically down in the MDMA group, much less in the psychotherapy only. People become mindful, they got to know themselves. And another thing is that a very big issue in my work is that when you get traumatized, people oftentimes identify themselves with their trauma. I have very much helped by the mental health profession who says, you're an incest survivor, you're a combat veteran, as if that's all there is to them. And uh, in part as an iatrogenic thing, that we start labeling people with their trauma and people start identifying themselves with their trauma. And after MDMA, people say, yes, I was sexually molested as a child, but there's many other things about me. So they stop being over identified with their trauma. A very big deal, actually. And of vast degrees in self-compassion. I don't know how experienced you guys are, but self-compassion is one of the hardest things to acquire if you have lifelong trauma, including abuse and neglect by your own caregivers. Second thing we measured was alexithymia. That may not be something that all of you think about all the time, but it's a very big deal. Alexithymia is an inability to know what is going on inside of you. Alexithymia clearly is the result of having caregivers who don't help you to identify who you are, to tell you uh, stop crying or give you something to cry about, and you're not allowed to feel what you feel. A very important part of becoming a well-functioning person is to know who this creature, you, is. Fascinatingly, in the MDMA treatment, there oftentimes is not a lot of talking. People go deep inside, re-experience stuff, feel stuff very deeply, but there is not any explaining or understanding to be done. But after people are over, they can, they know themselves. They can say, I feel this. This is where my reactions come from. This is what's going on inside of me. They can describe their feelings. They have a language for themselves. In my book, which some of you probably have read, I call this 
the, the, the watchtower of the brain, the medial prefrontal cortex goes offline when you're a traumatist and you don't know who this creature is, who you're experiencing. And after doing MDMA, people actually know who they are. And so overall, there's a vast increase in self-awareness and mindfulness. And then finally, and then another uh, measure I always use in all of my studies, yoga, EMDR, etc., is self-capacities. Uh, being able to negotiate interpersonal conflicts. Uh, for the, those of you in Melbourne who have been locked up for a long time during the pandemic, you know that living with another person may require a lot of wisdom to really negotiate complex things. When you're traumatized, you have a hard time with it. Traumatized people tend to be very um, reactive and oftentimes violent or shut down with other people. And after MDMA, people are able to negotiate interpersonal conflicts. Uh, traumatized people have a way of idealizing other people and saying, oh, that person is the most amazing person, has happened to many of us, and sometimes uh, we start believing that maybe we're amazing people because our patients idealize you. Uh, except when you know that idealization is a function of pathology, of people not realizing that everybody is just a human being. And uh, what happens oftentimes in trauma is people, first they put somebody on a pedestal and then they say, this is the worst person who ever lived. And after MDMA, people say, yeah, he's just a human being. He's a person with flaws. People with good things and bad things, uh, traumatized, huge abandonment concerns. When you take MDMA, you feel more at one in the universe. A very striking thing that we as researchers really cannot study is the whole issue of spirituality. But when you do psychedelics, the issue of being part of a larger universe always comes up. And getting mystical notions oftentimes happens. Robin Carhart Harris has written extensively about it. Uh, so after MDMA, people become self-aware. They learn affect regulation. They learn to hold their own. They are able to be more steady. Uh, they're more able to be contained. Uh, so uh, it really changes your self-experience. And rather than relying on the, uh, on the DSM as an outcome measure, we really should be studying who people are and people's self capacities and their mental functioning. Um, so, uh, so if I had my druthers, and if any of you are interested in this, I would actually want to do Rorschachs on anybody. Early in my career, I did several studies on the Rorschach where we showed that when you're traumatized, when you look at the ink blot like this, you project your own trauma on these ink blots. Uh, when I gave this to Vietnam veterans, they said, oh, this is a, a head that's blown off, or this is a ball that got a mortar shelled. We gave this workshop card to 138 rape victims, and the most uh, common response for rape victims was, this is a torn vagina after a rape. Uh, so after you get traumatized, your whole perception of the world changes. and I wish that in the next psychedelic study, we do the Rorschach to see how these, these agents can change your perception of the world. So that's all I'm going to say for now. And we have another half hour or so for questions. So I'm delighted to hear what you have to think about it. Well, um, can you hear me okay, Cecil? Hmm? Yeah, thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, and um, people uh, are, are very interested to ask you a lot of questions. There are already some questions in the chat as well. Um, I just wanted to start by asking your question. Do you believe that every human being has suffered with some kind of trauma or are carrying epigenetic trauma or collective trauma? You talked about carrying the trauma of all the patients or that you had, could identify with a lot of the trauma of all the patients in your MDMA session. Identify. I've taken it on. Yeah. A therapist in intense therapy, you feel what your patients feel. Huh? So uh, it actually becomes part of you and your somatic reactions reflect what the people you work with. No, I think 
trauma is not a universal issue. And uh, for example, I have a bunch of Australian friends. I wouldn't call none of them having a trauma history. I think it's very careful to not inflate the concept of trauma. Trauma is a horrendous experience that overwhelms your capacity to cope. It is not breaking up with being broken up by your boyfriend. It's not having an unpleasant date. It's not being locked up in your room because of COVID. That's those are unpleasant experiences. Life sucks a good part of the time, but not everything that sucks is a trauma. Yeah, thank you. Um... I'm just going to, and Scott, if you can also um, pick out some questions, that'd be great because there's just so many. Sure, happy to. I do have one that I received during while Bessel yeah. was speaking, which is a great one. Um, could Thank you comment you. on your views on touch in psychedelic assisted therapy? Um, sort of, I suppose, the roles and risks and, and wherever that takes you. Oh, that's a very good question. In fact, um, Today, we are actually in a ketamine assisted therapy training where we're doing one. Uh, and my wife is a body worker and she spent the day uh, doing touch experiences with people in order to give them embodied self awareness. Actually, our book that's almost finished uh, is on the subject, on the subject of uh, it's, the book is called Come to Your Senses on how to activate your senses. I think touch is a ter terribly important part, particularly for traumatized people. And my foundation these days is able to attract a fair amount of money because of the success of my book. And the very first study we funded is about a million dollar study on the effect of touch in trauma, which has never been studied before. So it is a very important thing to study. And I think touch in uh, psychedelic experience is terribly important. The trouble is, I barely know any psychotherapist who knows anything about touch. They have not been trained in touch and they don't know how to do it. And you need to actually become trained in using touch. So you need to study things like somatic experiencing, sensory motor psychotherapy, or study with my wife, Alicia Skye, uh, to really learn how to touch appropriately. And if you don't do that, you may actually violate people. And so while I think touch is terribly important, um, this is not for amateurs. Thank you for that. Scott, did you have another one there? Um, even perhaps another one to even just back off the back of that is um, another question that came in asking for the importance of music in MDMA sessions. Um, oh, that's really uh, not only in MDMA, but certainly also in psilocybin and ketamine, in that uh, the music is really quite wonderful in that it carries you into uh, new realms and it opens up your mind. Uh, in, in all the psychedelic groups I belong to, we really value music intensely. And I think one of the things that I did wrong when I had my own really very painful own first MDMA experience is that I said, I'm a musician, I want to choose my own music, and I played familiar music. And it was very clear, I would have been much better off playing music that was completely new to me, that would have sort of forced my mind to wander into new and unknown territory. And so the issue of music is terribly important and deserves a lot more attention. There's a question here as well about um, the role of collective trauma from Anesha, who says, in my mind, must undoubtedly be universal experience because hasn't every culture and people had their own experience of being mistreated in some way, shape or form? Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of that. You know, uh, generally, I get a lot of interviews these days and people say, oh, the collective trauma of COVID, for example. They go, I wasn't traumatized by COVID. It was, it sucked. It was unpleasant. I didn't get to hang out with people the way I wanted to hang out. It wasn't a trauma. For the nurses at the local hospital I worked with who saw people choke to death and didn't get support from their thing and who couldn't go home because they were afraid to infect their parents, they were traumatized. And let's really be very specific and let's not globalize, but really look at what happened to you. Uh, 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 don't make it superficial. Don't go there. Thank you for that. And um, there's a question here from Asha who says, has body movement dance been incorporated in 
into some of the sessions that you're doing with this this current work that you're doing in your study? Actually, uh, we are very much into body movement and in the workshops that we do. We always do a good amount of stuff. I learned it from Bishop Tutu. I was part of the Truth Commission in South Africa. And boy, did Bishop Tutu teach us how to dance and how great it is for trauma. But when you're on MDMA or ketamine, most people are lying like that. <laughs> and most people don't want to move on psychedelics. No, absolutely. <laughs> um, the um, just let me see this next one. Sorry, Scotty, I'm just trying to. There's so many questions here. Have you got another one there you want to pop in? Yeah, and I'll, it, would yeah. we like to perhaps? There's a couple of people who have hands up. Um, we'd like to ask you, if Kriya, if you'd like to like to ask your question, um, and and please try to ask quite quite quickly so so we can answer as many questions as we can. But you just have to unmute yourself first. Oh yeah, yeah, great. I think I've got it. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Great. First, I just want to thank you, Bessel. Um, amazing, fantastic. I so appreciate what you're offering to us. And I wanted to ask you about if you know about psilocybin and can you say, well, have you worked with psilocybin and, and can you say the difference between MD, working with MDA and working with psilocybin? Uh, that's going to be an interesting <laughs> question. And look, for the last five years, I have a psychedelic part of my annual conference, and I always raise that question, and I've never had a satisfactory answer from anybody. They clearly are different substances, but even, you know, like I have seriously studied MD MDMA and ketamine, and yes. they clearly are different substances, but I don't have a clear idea about how they differ, have different psychological effects. Uh, psilocybin, for example, is much more mystical than certainly MDMA and to some degree also than ketamine. But whether psilocybin is a better treatment for anything in particular, we don't know. And it will be a long time before there will be studies because like our, our MDMA study cost 27 million dollars on study. Yeah. And so it's enormously complex and elaborate to do it. So it will depend on people who have uh, who have a lot of experience. I raised the question with my more steeped in the rule psychedelic colleagues. They say, well, Bessel, you do a little MDMA, and you do a little dope, and you do a little cyber. <laughs> I don't know the answers. So but you haven't done studies with psilocybin. You you haven't done studies with psilocybin. I studied MDMA, and I train people in ketamine. Yes. Uh, okay. Thank because you. Ketamine is legal. And I haven't I haven't scheduled one license. I don't mess with illegal substances. So I teach legal substances. Yeah. Well, it's just you know just for your information um, that psilocybin has just been legalized in or uh, whether de decriminalized or legalized in Oregon and oh, so yeah, there right. are and yes it's general, in Massachusetts and in Northampton little towns they say we are a nuclear free zone and we allow society you know, it's a <laughs> psychological phenomena uh, mm -hmm. so no, it's clearly it's happening it's going to happen on a large scale what I'm extremely worried about is that people will become careless Yes. And it's already happening with ketamine. Uh, a very disturbed of mine uh, wrote for eight dollars bill of ketamine, got it in the mail, and took it by herself. That was had a disastrous effect on her. And so once this gets utilized and people can make a lot of money on it, I'm very worried that it will go wrong. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and that that is a huge concern with with this whole field is you know that people take advantage and don't do the the treatments properly because they want to cut corners to save money. So uh, it happened last time. You know, my team is all young and they say, "Oh, we are part of a revolution," and I always say, "You're part of the second revolution because I was part of the first rev revolution also, and the first revolution went south, it went completely down the drain, and I'm worried that the same thing might happen this time." Thank you. Yes. The huge concern. Thank you. Um, just a few more questions. I mean, there's, there's hundreds of questions in the chat. Can we just make sure that everyone's mic is muted when they're not um, speaking as well? 
Um, this question here, what are your thoughts on therapists who feel it is detrimental to have patients, clients relive their traumas? And how does this play into positive results for MDMA? So this so is therapists who feel it is detrimental to have patients, clients relive their traumas. Well, uh, they're entitled to their opinion. There's no scientific evidence for that, but you know, like what do I think about people who are incompetent? They're incompetent. Like, like, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And then there's a next question here. Do you think that ADHD is triggered by childhood trauma? I've told you what I think about DSM. Mm -hmm. It is a political instrument that has no scientific validity. ADHD is a very good example. ADHD is a surface thing of people who have a hard time concentrated, are hyperactive. There are multiple ways of developing those particular symptoms. Almost every kid I've ever seen, and that's a lot of them, who was traumatized, would meet criteria for ADHD. That doesn't mean that every kid with ADHD has been traumatized. So, so we've got to get a better diagnostic system that is not about superficial surface phenomena. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, Catherine, do you have a question there that you'd like to ask um, the doctor? The... Just unmute yourself, please, if you could, if you can. You can't? Ilan, can you make sure that Catherine could unmute herself, please? Or Scott, could you? Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm just wondering about the, the when it's likely to be available as a treatment in Australia, um, because I've yeah. contacted my medicine in Australia before and understand, you know, you could travel to, I think it's Israel or Switzerland. Um, yeah, but whether there's possibility to be involved in trials or, you know, how long. Are, you a, are you a therapist, Catherine? I'm studying psychotherapy at ICON, but it's a okay. personal interest for me for living with, um, yeah. you know, significant consequences. But you know, you don't have to wait to till this is legal. You can actually, in the meantime, learn neurofeedback, for example. Mm, in its own way, is a remarkably good treatment also. Or learn hypnosis or learn EMDR. You know, this is not Christ our Savior is born. It's a very interesting, useful new treatment. Yeah, so I've... I've um... I've had the I've done with a psychologist on the EMDR yeah. and do a lot of meditation. I don't know what the neurofeedback that you refer to treatment is, um, but I feel like I do all the right things. I found CBD oil useful in terms of staying in that window of tolerance, yeah. um, but it still feels like something that really significantly impacts. You know, I've had you know front page yeah. of the newspaper trauma um, over a protracted period of time, and just for me, it's quite yeah. I would not encourage you to go to the Netherlands or Israel. Like my team, for example, that does legal ketamine training has a two year waiting list. Mm. So the chance that you get good treatment somewhere else is pretty slim. Just sit still and we'll come legal in Australia before too long. So what you think five year time frame or? Well, in the US, we're thinking about a year and a half from now. Okay. Yeah. So maybe a five-year time frame is reasonable. And, and, and Australia is always very obedient to America. Whenever we go to war, you guys immediately follow us. And so the moment it becomes legal in America, probably you guys will be good old Australians and follow in America's footsteps. Catherine, we definitely don't say it as five years. I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. The TGA has indicated that um, they will follow the US in, in that respect. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, there's some questions here on, uh, like about um, intergenerational trauma and how do we break those sort of patterns? There's quite a few different variations on that question. Do you believe in intergenerational trauma? Do you believe in the American poet who said they fuck you up, your mom and dad? <laughs> they fuck you up, your mom and dad. Like, duh. <laughs> like, you know, we all carry the legacy of our parents. Like, yeah. So what do you think about it? You have parents, and so you carry their stuff with you. Like, yeah. 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 And we, we have to um, just keep being uh, evolving ourselves as best we can with all the healing tools we can. Paul Pavlakis, you've got a quick question there. If you can unmute yourself. 
Oh, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure, uh, Dr. Van der Kolk. Your book changed my life many years ago. Thank you so much. Um, in relation to overseas, um, if someone was to, you just mentioned it, not to travel for this sort of stuff and wait for it to come here, but if someone couldn't wait, would there be any other places in Europe perhaps where one could apply uh, that you might know of? Uh, such as the Netherlands, the synthesis yeah, retreat yeah, or something yeah, along those lines. Long guy. You know, I have a license to give MDMA in my study. I would do nothing that's even remotely illegal. And I don't hang out with people who do things illegal, not because I disapprove of it necessarily, but I'm clean as a dog's whistle myself. So that's the question you want to ask somebody else. I'm sorry. Uh, I just thought maybe there's some legal retreats that have approval already, but there, there no, isn't. So, Paul, um, on our website, you can find a list of legal retreats, Anderson. I'll ask jo um, yep. Scott if you oh. can put that link in there now in the chat, please. That'd there's, be wonderful. There's, retreats, you know, there's all kind of retreats, but there's other ways of going there. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. Um, Bessel, there's also been a lot of questions about the study that you're, you showed a lot of. Um, results from the current study that you're working on is there somewhere that people can find that interim is there some kind of interim results of your study that people can view at the moment or is that not at all available no i just sub submitted it today for to a journal and then i have to wait probably um six months to a year to hear if they will publish it so and in the meantime i cannot release the information because it's um needs to be published first yeah Thank but you, you you heard my talk you can go over it you can see it that's what we yeah, found absolutely yeah. um if you could just share those slides with Alan, we can make sure that they at least um are on the talk and then raf says during a psilocybin session the default mode network goes offline is there any data on changes in the default mode network months later is <laughs> <laughs> now, I've already heard that uh, no, these, these words are usually used by people who are not neuroscientists, and they think they are more substantial people if they use fancy neurological terms like default mode network. Um, you know, it, stay with what you see, stay with what you notice. In fact, uh, I'm actually very skeptical about the uh, default mode network in that, in that PTSD itself knocks out your default mode network. Uh, and uh, so it changes that. And it's not clear at all if how psilocybin affects the default network in traumatized people. So it's an interesting uh, neuroscience question, but unless you're a neuroscientist, I'm afraid that you would have a hard time really make meaning out of it. It's a fancy okay. term, makes you sound smart, but maybe not. Yeah. Thank you for that, I appreciate your can I, can, I, <laughs> um, can I jump in with a question yeah. off the back of that? Cause this is coming back to, to seeing what you can see. Um, and someone's asked, I'd love to know how these different attributes that you showed in your talk are measured to track progress in the patient. Um, and for example, is it through self-reporting? I've been tracking progress in my own complex trauma patients and often question how to get and be sure of the most accurate result. Yeah. Well, the last thing I showed you, I think the Rorschach is the best instrument to measure how people's mental changes, uh, status changes. And I've done a good amount of research on it that's on our website if you want to find it. Uh, and the other thing is informants ask people's spouses. Have we are, have, for example, I had a ketamine experience, my first own experience, and uh, what it did for me, I was blown in outer space. I was in 2001 Space Odyssey, hurled through the universe. I came down. I lost my mind. I lost my body. I like my mind. I like my body. So I didn't really love all that much being in outer space. I came back and I said, that's an interesting experience. It didn't do very much for me. My wife says I became a much, much nicer person after that. Ask your wife. She can tell you how it's changed you. We are very poor self observers, you know. So ask people's parents and their teachers and other people how are they reacting differently? Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you very much. Um, Lucy, is that you, Lucy? Lucy Phone, would you like to ask a quick question? We'll unmute you. Thank you. Uh, hi there, uh, Thessal. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. Um, I'm personally going to go into a lead journey with someone that does stuff in Australia, um, someone with a lot of kind of qualifications that I feel really comfortable <clears throat> with. We've had several sessions um, before leading into it and I'm deciding between psilocybin and MDMA and I'm not asking so much about that because I realise from the other question you can't comment on that. But I am wondering, you mentioned the neurofeedback options yeah. and you're saying, you know, while people are waiting, you know, can you um, mention the top few? I've heard of EMDR um, and was going to look at that, but are you talking about things like EFT or neuroemotional technique? What are some of the neurofeedback type loops that you feel will work well? Neurofeedback, I talk about three brain waves. Uh, it's it, the, the my main contacts in Australia. They're in Moshi Pearl in in Melbourne and Mariana Askovic in uh, Sydney. They're very good neurofeedback practitioners. You wire your skull up to electrodes. You project it on a computer and you play computer games with your own brain to change your brain waves. Basically, I don't know anybody in Adelaide who does it, uh, but. You can probably find out. And so this is different from uh, neuromodulation or EFT. You know, EFT is just it's just tapping yourself. It's not, you know, it's just these are nice little things you can do that are helpful for people. Um, and it's these are nice overall parts of real therapy. It's not like the answer is EFT or the answer is that's not, but uh, neurofeedback is feed, a unique way of restructuring the brain. The, uh, Would you mind posting or making sure that Ivan or someone gets the names of those therapists? Moshe Pearl in Melbourne, okay. Juliana Askovic in Sydney. Yeah. Might need to get the spelling of that last one. Thank you so much. Um, there's quite a few questions here too, um, Bessel, about um, treating children. The children also deserve a chance to heal. And of course, the trauma is often much closer um, in time. What is your thoughts on what is happening? You know, at the moment, all the trials are, are for adults, but what is your feeling on, on treating children through these therapies? Well, my, my attitude is, first of all, have people learn good child treatment. Uh, become a good therapist. You know, uh, my clinic treated hundreds, if not thousands of traumatized kids. We did very well with them. If you go on our website, the Trauma Research Foundation website, uh, in the resource section, you'll see a lot of uh, child therapists talking about how to do trauma treatment with kids. And th that's fine, just do it. Don't go give psychedelic substances to kids. Give them very good psychotherapy and do some neurofeedback with them. And then if that's not enough, start thinking about down the line. But first become a really good therapist with kids. Yeah. And a lot of people are also asking how they can train with you. <laughs> and um, I'll be in yeah. Australia again, as I always did before the pandemic. Uh, I'll go to Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney, uh, end of January, beginning of February. And if you type in my name and Gary Pike, who organizes that, you'll come up with the schedule. Uh, Fantastic. We'll share that also with all, with all of you. But if you want to about learning neurofeedback, the Trauma Research Foundation has a neurofeedback training program. If you want to learn about psychedelics, you guys are already doing a training program. Uh, the, main training program we rely on over here is the California Institute for Integral Studies that has in America training programs for psychedelic therapists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Scotty, do you have any other questions before we wind up? I, I know there's still Pamela and Felicity. Let me ask Bessel. Bessel, are you happy to answer two more quick questions? Uh, yeah, not too many because I right. still need go somewhere. So it's yeah, of course you do. <laughs> um, Pamela, do you have a quick question? 
Yes, um, much gratitude, Bessel. Um, I um, have been uh, using MDMA sessions, which have been assisted every time for fibromyalgia, which was, you know, I was suicidal, really. And that's been very fruitful. But, it, and I started in August last year, and then in the beginning of the year, we had horrendous floods here, and yeah. recognised that when my, Queensland, body, sorry. my body was really struggling. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so what has made all the difference to me, and I would have been completely lost, even though I had you know, very positive assisted MDMA sessions is the integration work. I would still be not functioning because of the flood trauma, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. What I wanted to know is in the studies that you've been talking about, and I get the impression there's just the one major one that for 27 yeah. years, yeah. did those participants get regular integration support and what was it? Did they all get the same? How did you work that? Because my experience is the the um, so the MDMA on its own just isn't enough. Well, I also only late in life at 62 yeah. recognize that I have had undiagnosed yeah. PTSD, which has complicated things, yeah. but I'm very persistent and I'm getting there. I think it's a very important question. In fact, some people ask me from time to time, what do you think should be the next thing to be studied in MDMA? And fibromyalgia is always high, high on the top of my list because fibromyalgia is basically a somatic expression of trauma. Uh, and uh, right now, our treatment methods are not particularly helpful for fibromyalgia. I'd say the best thing we know is very good body work. And I hope you have access to very good body work where you are. And I would, uh, you know, if I lived forever, and uh, I would love to do a study on fibromyalgia together with body work for uh, an MD MDMA to really help people bodies to calm down. I think it's a huge issue that needs a lot of attention. Uh, the the debriefing, the integration, as I said, when I talked about our study. We do a, spend a huge amount of, of time on the integration huh, that we do that. But at the same time, we're doing a study and the study has a protocol. And that means people get three whole days and all the integration sessions. But in a substantial number of people we see, we wish we had more sessions to do more work. And we're yeah. dealing with very traumatized people, but the protocol is three sessions and that's all you do because Basically, we're working with FDA to get a drug approved for a particular diagnosis. Um, but in clinical reality, of course, you give people as many sessions as they need. And uh, I would be very intrigued with more details about what it's like for you to take MDMA and fibromyalgia and what sort of body work you did. And I would love to hear what it did for you, uh, because I think it's one of the most pernicious consequences of trauma that is very difficult to treat. And so yeah. I'm very curious what the results are. And I'd be very eager if somebody would actually study it systematically. I think it's a very important topic. Thank you very much for that. And Pamela, if you could um, reach out to us, um, we'd be very interested in that. We've just announced this observational trial fund and we'd be very interested in looking at potentially an observational trial with fibromyalgia patients um, and that's it. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm, I'm in Byron Bay and I'll go to David Nutt's thing tomorrow. Um, yeah. I also, I actually want to write a book about it because, you know, yeah. I, I don't think I'd be here this year. Yeah. You know, and David Nutt knows a lot about psychedelics. He's one of the uh, m most experienced psychedelic researchers. I don't know if he has ever looked at fibromyalgia. You know, when you sit in the laboratory, you focus on a little piece of the whole puzzle, but you don't get to see the whole thing. So be curious what he has to say about it. But he may have... I stumbled into it, crawled into it, but, you know, just through a serendipity with several things, you know, seeing fantastic fungi with you guys. Um, I actually listened to a, um, a 
video by a chiropractor and when he said it's well we all know it's trauma without support my body just went yes you know and then it was uh the mdma i just knew nothing else has worked all my life so wow. yeah really profound please please do come to the session in byron bay and come and say hello you know and i think your story is typical everybody who i know who has recovered from trauma has been on a very oftentimes lonely road of discovery and they try out one thing and it doesn't work and they try out another thing doesn't work and people themselves find their way into different treatments and then they ask the experts people like me uh what should i do but everything i learn i know i learned from you <laughs> and so at the end I learn what I know from the pilgrims and the pilgrimages of people like you. And I can say, that's really seemed to work. Let me study it more. And so at some point, you are really the core knower about works. Mm, Just I know what doesn't work as well, <laughs> very <laughs> much. Thank you so much, Pamela. We'll just um Felicity's been waiting. Yeah. And we'll just have her ask her a quick question, Felicity. Mm -hmm. Um, hi there. Thank you so much for your talk. It's incredible. Um, I was just wondering, um, I was wondering if you just lost you, Felicity. You've gone on mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was just saying, I was wondering if you think there's like one general psychopathology factor um, that might be the most important in terms of how trauma manifests and how we treat trauma. So for instance, like um, a sense of lack of agency or poor interception um, or self-regulation. Um, and I was also wondering if in some of the trials you're doing, if you take like a, an RDOC or, or high tops approach where you've got this hierarchical taxonomy of psychopathology um, that really helps individualize treatment. Because I think when we're looking all the, at these amazing results, we see like an improvement of um, you know, self-awareness, self-compassion, um, lots of different important um, emotional regulation um, tools. But I, I'm wondering how people's baseline affects um, how they like, can improve them. Yeah. It sounds like you have not read my book. And I have. I, I have. Well, then yeah. you know that our mind and brain are as complex as what the t web telescope is showing us. Mm -hmm. Right? Our brain is as complex as the universe. And anybody who says, I have the answer, it is that, I know the critical factor, it's that, should be immediately dismissed because they don't know what they're talking about. The mind mm -hmm. is infinitely complex. And mm -hmm. actually, one of the things that we can be proud of is that from time to time, we figure out some correlations, some frameworks by which we can understand the brain, but mm -hmm. as Life goes on, the culture goes on, and science changes. We will have a totally different perspective on what happens. Yeah. Okay? So uh, we are just a bunch of ignorant human beings trying to figure out unspeakably complex phenomena. Thank you so much, Bessel. And I'm very conscious of the time. And I think we all just want to say to you, thank you so much for everything you bring into the world, everything that you're doing. It's Welcome. Oh, inspirational, and um, we look forward to yeah. supporting any of your events in Australia and um, welcoming you in any way that we can. Please share anything you want us to share. Thank you. And, um, uh, I'm looking forward to being back in Oz. Okay. Yeah, thank you. We hope to meet you in person. Take care. Bye. Have a beautiful evening. Thank you.